Welcome everyone and thank you for being at the National Civic League September webinar. So you want to be an All-America City. Uh, my name is Rebecca Trout and I direct the National Civic League's All-America City Award as well as communications and our DC office. And I'm really excited um, to be talking to you about the All-America City Award journey. Uh, we typically use this webinar series to highlight promising practices that come through that webinar series that touch on good governance and civic engagement and collaborative problem solving. So this is a little bit different than um, what our webinar series typically highlights. Um, but the All-America City Award is our flagship program. It began in 1949 as a way to recognize communities that were really using civic engagement to, to solve big challenges locally. We have awarded over 500 communities um, in our 74 years so far, and uh, you can read about them and uh, see some of their videos on our website. Um, so today we're going to be talking about specifically the 2024 award theme, criteria, important dates, and then we'll be hearing from three really recent winners who will tell you a little bit about their story and give you some tips. So before we kind of begin the 2024 journey, I just wanted to give kind of one last shout out um, to our 2023 winning communities that you see here on your screen. Um, these 10 communities that were sitting exactly where you are sitting right now about a year ago, um, and they submitted their applications mm -hmm. around the 2023 theme, which was focused on really engaging youth and civic life. Um, so as you as you look through these photos, you, this is kind of the culminating event of this whole process. If you uh, choose to submit an application, hopefully you'll be a named a finalist and we'll be putting on one of these very presentations uh, next June. So just want to congratulate all of them for their work. You can read about their uh, efforts that were featured in their application and even watch their live presentations on our website. So today uh, we are lucky to be joined by three of those winning communities um, from uh, sort of the left of your, your screen moving right. Um, uh, first up, we have Hampton, Virginia, um, their group uh, receiving their plaque at the end of the All-America City Award event. Uh, our speaker, one of our speakers, Robin McCormick, is there in the middle, who we'll be hearing from a little bit later. Um, the bottom left-hand corner, we've got our delegation from Davie County. They were, they were our lone county representative in uh, 23 and did a great job. Um, Ken Gamble has our has back to us in that photo uh, celebrating uh, the announcement of them winning the award. Uh, and then last but not least, we have uh, our folks from Mount Pleasant, uh, South Carolina. They put together a really great civic action fair booth, which is what you see there on your screen uh, with these um, really sought after baskets. Um, and their AAC captain that you'll be hearing from today is hard at work there in the background of that photo. Uh, Christian Farrell will be talking to us about Mount Pleasant's journey. Uh, but before we dive into all of their tips and advice, uh, just a few housekeeping items. You'll notice that you are all muted. Uh, we just ask that you remain that way um, and out of respect for our speakers and the content. We will have uh, time for Q&A at the end. You can put your questions in the chat as, you, as they come to you. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity to either read those out or you can unmute yourself, raise your hand and uh, ask those directly to myself or our presenters. And then last but not least, don't feel like you need to furiously take notes. So we are recording today's webinar. You'll receive the recording as well as these slides later today. Those will be sent to the email address you registered under. All right, and without further ado, we'll kind of jump into our 2024 All-America City Award theme. Uh, so as I mentioned, we've been giving this out. This will actually be our 75th anniversary. So it's a big anniversary year for us. Um, civic engagement is always going to be the backbone of our award. So it's um, how communities are using civic engagement to do X. And so our X this year, um, our theme for this year is strengthening democracy through local action and innovation. 
what we try to do with our themes is to really focus on something that is relevant to, uh, to communities and that communities are kind of grappling with or addressing locally. And since uh, 2024 elections are, are looming and we're seeing some of the challenges and threats to democracy from the national and the federal level kind of creep down into local civic life, we wanted to make sure that we gave an avenue um, to highlight sort of bright spots and promising practices of communities that are um, proactively addressing some of those threats to democracy. So here on the screen, you will see a couple of uh, project ideas that you might consider um, including in your application. Uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. There are a lot of different ways that you could be you know, strengthening democracy in your community. These are just um, items, ideas to kind of spark your interest. Uh, I won't read through all of them, uh, but uh, anything that would be increasing voter engagement or education, anything that is uh, civics education related, bridging divides, uh, creating conversations on difficult topics, maybe you're using some civic technology to better engage your communities in conversation. Um, or you're having a, a leadership institute to create uh, more civic leaders. Uh, so those are just a few ideas. If you are curious about whether or not a, an activity in your community kind of meets the theme, I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, or if you already have them in mind, we can talk about that during the Q&A towards the end of the program. Or um, I'm kind of your guide, uh, your Sherpa, if you will, throughout this process. So if you ever have a question uh, about anything, just shoot me an email. Happy to um, ask or answer any questions about the theme and whether or not a project meets the theme. Um, also, something to keep in mind is that um, the application will ask for three projects or programs that are community led and happening in your community. Uh, only one of them needs to be focused on this theme of strengthening democracy. Uh, so don't feel like you need to have a three-part uh, proposal on all of these things. You just have one, one project focused on the theme and you're in good shape. Uh, moving on to important dates, I have them in this really bright red uh, call-out box to emphasize them. Uh, so right now you are checking off the first that part, which is to participate in this informational webinar. Uh, one piece of advice I would give you is that we offer a lot of um, sort of group and one-on-one -on -one assistance offerings and really encourage you to take me up on all of those. Um, being more informed about the process can never hurt. Um, and I will tell you that the three individuals you'll hear from today were three of the more engaged captains, always asking questions, always participating in optional webinars and things like that. So. Um, it's not to say that if you participated in everything, you're definitely going to be a finalist, and you're definitely going to, to win, but it definitely helps to have uh, your leader of the community application process be as informed and engaged in the process as possible. Um, and then after this webinar, we'll also have additional monthly webinars, that, and those are open to anyone, whether you're considering um, applying or not. And they'll just be around this year's theme of, of democracy. Uh, so we'll be talking about voting reforms, we'll be talking about um, you know, participatory budgeting or um, removing toxic polarization from town halls, that kind of thing. So just really good webinar topics that you should chime in on uh, and tune in for, even if you decide that this year is not uh, the correct year for you to be applying for the award. Uh, moving on, December 14th is kind of the first finite deadline. Uh, that is when your letter of intent is due. Uh, so this is a, a very optional step, but one that I highly recommend. Uh, so a letter of intent, we have a template that we provide on our website within the application and within the email that you received when you downloaded the application. It's just a one page form that you say, I am from the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we are wanting to apply because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then the X, Y, and Z does not have to be particularly uh, long, just one or two sentences on why you think you might make uh, for a good applicant this year. Um, this is not required. If you miss that deadline and you still want to apply, you can. Uh, it, it's beneficial uh, to us because it helps us to know, you know how many people are planning on applying, therefore how many reviewers we need to wrangle. Um, and also, you know, whether or not we need to market the application to certain states more if we haven't received LOIs from a certain region of the country. 
Um, and then for you, it really helps to kind of uh, serve as a catalyst for the beginning of the process. Um, and then uh, more specifically, you get a hundred dollar discount off of your application fee. Uh, so ap an application fee of $250 is due at the time of your application. If you submit that LOI though, you get a hundred dollars off of it. Um, so never hurts to save a little bit of money. And then your actual application, oh, I'm sorry. And then the other benefit of submitting an LOI is that we can then um, uh, reach out with some more targeted one-on-one -on -one resources and even provide you with a mentor if you so choose. Uh, so definitely lots of pros to that without many cons. All right, moving forward, we have the application itself that is due. Uh, so if you have not already, I encourage you to download that application. Um, and you will notice it is the form of a Word document. We ask it to be um, submitted electronically without any photos other than the map that is requested and to just send it back as a Word document. I am here as a resource. If you want a mentor from a community who has applied before, you can request one of those who can um, answer questions and even review your application before you submit it. We will then be having those applications feverishly reviewed by our wonderful application review committee of uh, civic engagement and uh, local uh, governance experts. Uh, they will choose our 20 finalists. Everyone will get a direct one-on-one -on -one call letting you know whether or not you've been named a finalist. And then we'll do a big sort of national announcement and push of those um, finalists in March. And then um, our three speakers that later today will tell you that from March to June, you will be very busy um, if you choose to go forward with this process and if you are named a finalist. Uh, there's a lot to prepare for. Um, as a finalist, you are expected to join us in Denver for the um, sort of second stage of the competition, which is the uh, event in Denver. Um, so be prepared for that. So March through June means taking care of all of those travel logistics, uh, identifying your team, and then preparing for your in-person presentation to the jury. And the event itself is scheduled for June 7th through 9th. We have, uh, it takes place at the Hilton Denver City Center. We have a block of hotels that discounted rates uh, available for all of the finalists. Um, the event features keynote speakers, lots of networking with your fellow finalists, uh, idea sharing with those people. Um, and then probably the most important part is the presentation itself. You will take your written application and you will bring it to life in the form of a 10 minute presentation to an 11 mem member jury. Uh, you will um, find a creative way to uh, bring your written projects uh, to life on that stage. So those are kind of the nuts and bolts of the process. Um, and now I'll go over a little bit, um, some of the application components. Uh, so the first thing that you'll see is we'll just ask for some basic statistics and maps. That's just to give us a better idea of your demographics, where you are regionally, so we can kind of um, sort of place you um, and, and some of the issues you might be facing. Um, uh, the Census Bureau is a really great resource for uh, that section. Your community story section is not actually graded. Um, that part of your application is just for background. Uh, anything that we need to know about your community kind of to sort of set the stage for the rest of your application, um, I'd include there. So if there has been sort of a cultural shift in your community, a demographic shift, a big growth or a big decline, um, or, you know, a tragedy that your community dealt with, um, that would be um, good to include in your community story. Then we'll begin getting really into kind of the meat of the application. Uh, so a lot of people will understandably get uh, hung up and focused on the three projects, which of course are important, um, but describing your community's civic capital is also uh, really important. Uh, we describe this in more detail with both within the application and within a document from the league called the civic index. Basically your uh, civic capital, um, it's the people, resources, um, and avenues that your community uses to solve problems um, and to take advantage of opportunities. Uh, so that to us, that is made up of a shared vision and values and how your community decided on that shared vision and values. Uh, a culture of engagement, are, are community members vested in civic life and how can you show that to us? Uh, that goes hand in hand with engaged residents. 
um, inclusive community leadership? Do you have avenues for uh, leadership building? That could be academies, it could be mentor programs, it could be making sure that um, city council is diverse or that you have a youth leadership program. Um, you might describe your inclusive community leadership in a number of ways. Uh, embracing diversity and equity. Um, do your kind of uh, demographics match uh, the participation uh, in your community? Are programs that, um, considering equity and inclusion um, as, as they're being implemented? Uh, authentic communication. Uh, we don't necessarily mean how many people are subscribed to your newsletter um, or how many followers you have on social media. We are talking more about two-way communication. So what avenues do you have to speak to residents, but also how do they um, let you know what's on their minds and what's of concern to them? Uh, and then last but not least, collaborative institutions. <clears throat> and by that, do we mean that uh, the municipality and the school system and the business community, the Chamber of Commerce and the faith-based community and the NGO sector, did they collaborate? Did they communicate with one another? Did they work on projects together? And how can you show that to us? And then last but not least, the application, of course, is made up of three projects or programs. Um, and the idea here is to not necessarily focus on city services implemented at a high level. That's incredibly important. Um, and there are all kinds of other organizations and awards that recognize good city services. Um, but that's not what the All America City Award is about. We are about uh, recognizing communities um, who showcase efforts that are addressing challenges in an in inclusive and in collaborative way. So your projects should really be community led or driven. Um, they should have involvement by a number of stakeholders and not just city government. And as a reminder, um, at least one of those projects needs to be focused on the sheer theme of strengthening democracy. And again, only one project needs to focus on that theme. Uh, moving forward, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the application criteria. I don't wanna get too specific on, on these because they're um, listed in greater detail within the application, but I just kind of wanted to give uh, a layman's um, explanation of each. Uh, so when you're you're writing out your project, you want to make sure that these components are evident. Um, so shared vision, what we might mean by this, that this isn't just a pet project of the city manager or of the mayor, that it was the community who came or were at least involved in identifying um, the topic as, as a challenge or as an opportunity. So it's really kind of a shared um, effort from the very beginning. Civic engagement, you're probably sensing a theme. We wanna make sure that, that residents and everyday citizens were involved um, through the very beginning. So it could be from the ideation phase to the implementation phase, all the way through evaluation. Um, how is this not just a city led or a school district led project even? You know, How are you listening to and learning from and involving residents in the actual effort that you're highlighting? Inclusiveness and equity, again, we want to make sure that these projects are not just including sort of the usual suspects that always show up to town hall meetings. Um, how are you going out of your way to make sure that you're including a diverse segment of your population in these efforts um, and that you're also considering um, uh, equity and the outcomes and the impacts portion of, of the project as well. Uh, collaboration, again, um, getting a little bit repetitive here, but we want to make sure that um, all parts of your community are, are um, involved and in collaborating on the, on the project. Uh, innovation, we don't necessarily mean innovation and in the typical uh, definition of that word. If there is something completely new and outside of the box and you're using AI in a way that no community's ever used it, absolutely, that, that would uh, make the case. Uh, but really, it can be as, as simple as creatively using and leveraging uh, your community stakeholders and your community resources. So if a youth-led nonprofit is already doing something, um, repurposing and strengthening and um, enhancing their work instead of entirely reinventing the wheel, would it be an example of innovation? Uh, and then last but not least, we're really concerned and sort of the second stage of this, if you get in front of the jury, um, uh, will be impact. So how can you show that this is make this project, this effort is making a difference on outcomes, statistics, um, 
numbers are great if you have them. Um, if not, stories can work in a pinch. If it's a newer project or effort, then you, what you can do is you can say, these are the things we hope to improve upon, and these are the ways that we're going to track our success. Um, so just letting us know that you're at least thinking about impact would be great. All right, um, so that was a lot of information from me very quickly. Uh, again, you'll receive this recording um, as well as the slides. And then, of course, if you have any follow up questions, we'll hear from uh, we'll take those at the end. And then I'm also available via email. Uh, but now I want to hand it off to our speakers. They're going to be able to provide you with some insights that that I just can't. I've never been in their their shoes before. They they were listening to the same webinar a year ago, and they can talk to you a little bit about their journey and some of the tips that they have for you. Uh, so first up, we're going to be hearing from Ken Gamble, who's the town manager of Moxville. Um, he actually led our uh, our lone county effort this year um, out of Davie County. He was, um, and Davy County was a first time participant and applicant. Um, so he has a very unique perspective to share with you. Ken? And Ken, you're on mute. I had to switch screens anyway. So let me get. Okay, so thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that introduction and welcome to everybody who's on the call today. It's great to see such so many communities interested in pursuing this distinction. Um, as Rebecca said, we're the only county that was uh, in the competition last year. And Davie County, just so you know, we're a small county uh, with 46,000 residents, 75% uh, of the finalists had greater populations than us. And not only are we a small county, but we're a small county of small towns. Uh, the largest town only has 6,000 people. So never think that you're too small to be competitive in this competition. It's about your programs and it's about your engagement. It's not just about your size or how flashy of a program you can put together uh, in the competition. So, it, it's a little bit different when you're collaborating with other political entities in your community. And this could be not just local governments, this could be other a COG or some other entity that's not directly connected to your local government. So it's really important from the beginning that you get everybody on board. And when you're talking about getting everybody on board, you're talking about the managers, you're talking about the governing boards to begin with. Um, and I'll have to admit, I had an ulterior motive when I made the application or when I pitched this uh, to the other communities. And that was, we all know we live in a time now that is so polarized. And communities get so focused on the negatives and the things they disagree with each other about. And sometimes it's hard to make progress when all you're considering is, is the, the scoreboard and what you feel are things that didn't go your way. So one of the things that I wanted to do, and I think every community should look at, is what are the good things that are going to come out of this application and this process that you can use as a stepping stone to make other improvements in your community, even if it's just improving the relationships between your managers and your boards and in, in the in the county you're in, or even in the town you're in. So getting started, we started out with, um, we used an existing area meeting to talk about All America. We have a quarterly meeting with the mayors and the managers and, uh, and a couple of uh, council members. We all get together, we talk about things that are going on. Uh, we try to work out issues between the towns, that kind of things. If you don't have a meeting like this, this is a great opportunity to get something like that started. And when I'm talking about being intentional and having an ulterior motive, you can make a lot of great improvements and never get the nod for being a finalist or going to Denver to compete. So just keep that in mind as you're going. There's some there's just some great benefits for being involved in the program and in the process. So 
We used an area meeting to start talking about this. We got buy-ins from the boards and the managers. And then we moved on to um, what I just said, getting buy-in from the managers and the boards. Uh, team branding is really important when you have more than one major participant and more than one political entity, because there is a tendency for someone to want to take um, credit for everything that's going on. So when we started having our meetings, those uh, seals that you saw, those were at the beginning of every page. We had, it was the All-America Committee and everybody's seals were on there. We made sure that all of the board members, all of the boards and all the managers got updated and notified of everything that was going on. So we kept everybody in that information loop. So they felt involved from the very beginning. Uh, because sometimes, uh, even when you're trying to do something good, it can get sidetracked if somebody feels like they're being left out. But at the end of the day, someone also has to be captain. So when you're thinking about getting started, whether you're a community, whether you're an organization, uh, or whether you're a group that's coming together to make the application, make sure that the person that you select to be captain is a good meeting facilitator. They have good skills with working with people. They're not going to be coming in and uh, setting down the law and saying, this is the way it has to be. Uh, because when you're working as a group, trying to get all of these things together, you have to have that group cohesiveness. But you also need somebody who can make decisions uh, where you don't have to wait weeks and weeks to find out what somebody thinks about something or whether somebody uh, uh, above them needs to approve um, a certain thing that you're trying to do. And that's the same thing when you're going into selecting a team you want to make sure at the get-go that you've got a good mixture of program staff from the pr different programs that you want to highlight in your application. You want to make sure you've got uh, people who are good at organizing, and you want people who are good at writing. They don't necessarily have to be in the same program, but somebody who is a good writer who can take a bunch of disparate information and put it together and make it make sense and really tell your story compellingly, that's going to make a great difference when you put your application in. Uh, we were fortunate that we had two really good writers. Uh, when we put together the application, the programs submitted all of the things that they thought met the guidelines. Then the writer sat down and put that into a format that was both easy to read. It told a story. It wasn't too um, it wasn't too statistics heavy. Uh, but when we saw that there weren't statistics or measures, we had, we addressed that as well. So um, the you want to make sure that when you're forming your team as well, that people understand that this is a work group and it's not a group that they uh, are going to be part of and not have any expectations about deliverables. Uh, you don't want any dead weight on your team. A good example of um, looking at the, the writing is uh, making sure that one of the issues we had with a, a couple of our programs is they didn't collect any uh, measurable statistics for progress or for success. But even though the programs weren't collecting it, there were other entities that did have data that we could use to tell the story of that program. And also understand that when you're telling your story, there's the law of unintended consequences. Usually we think that's bad. You know, you try to do a good thing and something bad happens, but sometimes you try to do a good thing, you have certain goals in mind, and something else good happens that you weren't planning on. Make sure you tell that story as well. Um, we had a program that was in the local high school, and the goal was to increase the graduation rate. So we were looking at the graduation rates, uh, and we found out that one of the subsets of the programs they offered, uh, actually, if the, the people who were in that program 
had a 98% graduation rate compared to the normal students who were the normal student population. So not only did we find out uh, we, were, we were making the grade in one area, we also found out something and which made us ask questions and it might lead to further program improvements for the entire program, uh, trying to figure out what was it about that particular program that really works. Um, when you're thinking about your team, I want you to remember one of the most important members is in this picture. She's at the end with an orange top on, and she's been already talking this morning. Uh, that's Rebecca. I can't tell you how many times I picked up the phone or sent her an email. I had a question about something. I was just worried about something. I wanted to make sure that it, that it sounded right, that it wasn't going to be... Um, an issue if we did something a certain way, or just to ask advice, make sure you're using that resource. And if you decide to get a mentor, really lean on that experience and, and the information they give you, knowing at the end, it's your community, you know your community, you know your programs, but it can help remove some of the stumbling blocks, you know, to know where other people make, made errors. So you can't get in if you don't enter. I really encourage everybody on this call to turn in a letter of intent and to do the application. You're going to learn so much about your community and about the programs that you have in your community that even if you don't get selected as a finalist, it's going to be useful information for you moving forward. So this sounds very basic, but follow instructions. Uh, if you've ever written a grant, if you've ever made a proposal, uh, if you're not following the instructions, you are lowering your chances of getting in, uh, involved in the process and actually getting uh, approval or getting whatever it is you're asking for. You want to answer all of the questions fully, even when it exposes a weakness in your program. Take that as an opportunity to say, as we were looking at this application, as we were talking about this, we found out we're not doing A or B or C. And here's what we're going to do moving forward. It shows that you are thoughtful about your program. It shows that you're willing to admit where you have weaknesses. And also it helps you. It's going to help your program at the end of the day, especially if you can find something that uh, that maybe you're doing and you don't realize it's having a negative impact on it. Ask questions and take advantage of the assistance. Uh, this is Rebecca. This is your fellow, um, the, your fellow former winners. This is anybody that you might have mentoring you. Ask questions. Uh, don't worry about not knowing the answer. Don't worry about appearing like you don't know anything. Davie County, this was our first time applying. Uh, you can call it beginner's luck, but we asked so many questions. If we weren't sure about it, we asked. So uh, if you don't ask and, you, and you're wrong, sometimes you only have your uh, self to blame. Uh, finally, uh, you want to apply to win right? This application is your key to the doorway. If you don't do a good application, that door's not going to open. You're not going to have the opportunity to be a finalist and put together that great presentation and go to Denver and have the experience of working with so many other wonderful communities that are doing cutting edge things to improve uh, the community for everybody. Uh, going back to what I said earlier, know your program data but also be open to supporting it with outside data. We had another program that we highlighted last year uh, and we were talking about success in um, community college. Well, we were able to find a statistic for national graduation and completion rates for community college. And we found our program was far above that. So make sure you know what you know but sometimes, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And having a good writer, somebody to look over that, that's not involved in the program, they can ask those questions that can help you uh, improve the application. Um, this is something I did not do. Um, we were, uh, 
we thought we put in a good application. We did not think being a first time in that we would be a finalist. So when Rebecca notified me, I was really surprised. And I was I was wishing that I had spent a little bit of time thinking about some of these things. So do yourselves a favor and at least give some thought to what are we going to do if we're selected as finals? And that includes cost sharing. Uh, if there's multiple agencies involved in your application, it can include ideas about how are you going to raise funds to get your delegation to Denver, um, even ideas for presentations. And now you don't, I would not go and spend a week uh, working on all these things, but just having that initial conversation with your team about it is going to help you when you get the notification, hopefully, that you're a finalist. And finally, I'm going to leave you with um, how do you leverage your All-America experience? And, and I'm not here to tell you that I know everything. I don't. Uh, we're a first-time winner. Uh, some of the things that we're doing, you see my lovely pin on my shirt here. Uh, we've got those kinds of things, but we're, we're also connected with a real estate campaign where we've got the All America logo when we're promoting our community through realtors. We we share the All America information in economic development. We share we share that about our community, the road signs, everything. We are super proud of of the of what our team did in Denver. The other thing you want to think about, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning, what are you going to do with that extra civic capital? What are you going to do with those bragging rights? And give some thought to what are some of the bigger problems in our community we might want to work with after an All-America, being an All-America finalist, being an All-America -All winner, or just being involved in the process. So um, you want to capitalize on the community and goodwill. Uh, what we're doing in Davie County is we're trying to improve civic engagement ahead of our 2024 comprehensive plan revisions all over the county. And we're also raising money for the four programs that we highlighted in the competition. And I'm sorry, three programs we highlighted in the competition. So um, anyway, I appreciate your time and thank you so much for uh, letting me speak today. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Ken. Really appreciate you touching specifically on, you know, the benefits of just just participating um, and just putting together an application. You will learn so much about your community um, and be really surprised by um, some of the people and the efforts that come out of the woodwork in that process. All right, next up, we're going to hear from Robin McCormick from Hampton, Virginia. Um, Hampton, um, of, the, of the people on this call, has won the award the most. I believe they're a four-time winner, so a little bit different uh, perspective. They were kind of old pros at this process uh, by the time they were joining us in 2023. Robin, the floor is yours. I truly feel like I'm going to say stuff that Rebecca and Ken already said. Um, so I might wing it a little bit and try to hit some angles that they didn't. And I will tell you, I did the application nine years ago, I think, when we won. And I swore I would never do it again, that the city of Hampton would not apply again until after I retired. Because you need to know going in, this is a boatload of work. It is, as Ken said, really valuable in a lot of ways. But you you have to have that commitment and you see all these people like they really have to work together and and learn how to understand each other. Um, where's my little answer? OK, so and I really focus on the application process because that that is your gateway and that's the way you figure out really what it is you have to offer and what stories it is you have to tell. Um, and, and for us, the team that did the application was not the team that went to Denver. We, we switched it up and we had a lot of the experts help us with the application. But when it came to Denver, you don't want just the people who run the programs. You want people who are in the programs. You want people who have benefited from them or have contributed to why they started. And so a lot of times it was city staff and school staff um, who helped me put the information together and gather the data. 
but it was not the same people that we took. I asked them, so who do we who do we take? Who who represents the success of your program or who represents what you guys do? So fewer than half of our people actually worked for either the city or the schools when it came time for that. But really and truly, this is so much work that I could only think about each step at a time. <laughs> Okay, do the application and then if Rebecca calls, you've got to take the next step. I, I do think you have to be up for figuring out how you're going to pay for it because you don't want to go through all this and be an applicant and, and be a finalist and then say, oh, holy cow, nobody's willing to pay for this. Nobody's willing to help send these people or do fundraising or whatever it is you choose to do. So really make sure you have that commitment going forward and then ignore the second half of the process until you get through the first half. So I would say, and I think Rebecca said this, and, and Ken too, be honest about your city. This is not about, I am the perfect, shiny, happy city because A, you're gonna show improvement. So you start out great, then you got nothing to show. But also you've got to learn um, as you go and you just, you have to be honest about what your challenges are or your successes don't sound that good. You know, we think we did this huge thing. Well, you've got to understand why it was a huge thing. It's not just about the programs. It's about how your residents, businesses, nonprofits, churches, whoever it is, had their input into the community. And it's not always a pretty process. It might be that some activists came in and completely derailed your plans, but you adjusted, you made it work with them. It, it might be your first three projects that you've done with community input and they, they didn't turn out great, but you learned a lot and you're moving forward in that vein. You still got a good story to tell as long as it has that um, engagement. That's, that's the key to deciding what three projects you want to highlight, I think. And again, they don't tell you why you won. So everything I'm telling you could be like total BS and Rebecca will come back on later and say, oh no, <laughs> that wasn't right at all. But we're hoping. So don't, don't fake it. Um, and our numbers, I think this reason I use the visual here, our numbers weren't great. We have more children living in poverty. We have less income per capita than the rest of the state. And so I think it's important to go ahead and face that and show where you're starting out. Um, you've got to have data. You've just got to have data. I mean, the first time we did it, we had school scores. I think it was a mayor's book club that did preschool and first grade and kindergarten reading. And then we showed the second grade reading scores before and after. You could be really creative about that. It could be the number of people who showed up was twice as many as the number of people who showed up before. It could be, you know, in this case, maybe more registered voters, more people who vote, progress in a certain group or demographic in terms of engagement. Participation is a measurement. It's, you know, you'd rather show success, but if you can show more participation, you've got something. And like Ken said, the stats might not be yours. I think one of the things I showed the first time around was nationally students who graduate from high school, you know, do better or cost less or whatever. And that wasn't our statistic. That was something I got from elsewhere. Um, but really talk about how you got citizen input, who was involved, were they diverse? How did you reach different groups of people? Maybe instead of the ones who stepped forward, how did you go out and change that? Um, and if you don't have a ton of quantitative data, use qualitative data, use some anecdotal results, use some comments from the participants, what they said, what they learned, anything to just show that you made a difference because that's what it's about. Um, personal tips, again, you've got to be in it all the way. It is a lot of time and a, a fair amount of money. And if your city isn't going to clear time away from the staff involved, you're gonna kill yourselves. You've gotta have that commitment from the very top so that when you ask somebody from information, they're gonna actually give it to you and not put you at the bottom of the pile because that was real hard for me, um, you know, just trying to get a hold of people because they have jobs. The you know person who heads our youth and young engagement group was busy. She's busy spending a grant and running programs. And it was very hard sometimes to get information. What I found, I'm a former, newspaper, you know, a journalist, but 
interview people and listen to them talk. And then you can kind of find some nuggets of information or some things that might work out. Other people might send you stuff in writing. You might have to go out and get some additional stuff, but take that time um, to do it. And I say application writer because I, I put most of it together. And I think you have to have one person and one voice who makes the final cut and, and pieces it together. Um, but don't be a solo artist, you know, walk the walk that this is about input, throw it out there and say, this is what I wrote, but you know, what do you think? Where, where are we strong? Where are we not strong? What am I missing is a huge thing to say. I mean, people have to have the ability for input, but in the end, you have to tie it all together. I remember the input from our school system, they wrote it and I edited it and they rewrote it. And then I kept editing it because they speak to educators. They have a shorthand that they all understood that is a whole lot of sense and a whole lot of acronyms and a whole lot of stuff I didn't understand. And if I don't understand it, I don't think the public's gonna understand it. Even though there are very um, professionals who were on the panel, you wanna make it make sense to everybody. So in the end, I, um, I, I just rewrote a lot of their stuff after I understood what it meant. But the other thing is they, I asked them for information about one program and they said, hey, we're doing this other program too. Can we throw that in? Because we think that one's more innovative and we've used you know, student involvement and we're changing it because of student involvement. And I'm like, sure, shoehorn it in there. I had no clue that you were doing that. It's a great thing. So we learned a lot. Um, there's way more work ahead, but don't think about this. Get through the application process. As Ken said, you have to really, there is a lot in this that's good. And frankly, I don't see it while I'm in the middle of it because it is a lot. But once you're done, I mean, we had, if you look at our group who went to Denver, um, when they asked, we, we did our presentation and they, the jury asked questions. And that's a school question. Well, the school superintendent is right there. And he did not step forward. The people who stepped forward was our freshman and our, well, I've lost her now, our junior. And they answered the questions. And the cool thing is they did it as a team. They looked at each other. Nobody said a word. They looked at each other and they went forward to that microphone. And these were kids, you know, I had to spend a lot of time pulling them out. And so did everybody else. But once we worked together a few times, we all had a rhythm. And those people, you know, those students know the school superintendent and the mayor in a way that not very many people do. And that's a resource you can call on. I mean, those are young people that I could call years later and say, hey, how did this program make a difference to you? I'm writing another one of these applications or whatever I need, and I know they will do it. So that's it. My email is on there. If anybody has any questions, I'm always willing to help. Um, it, it was a really good experience. and. I think the first time maybe we didn't maximize it, what wasn't the first time, first time in the 2000s, 2010s. But, but I think we're working on doing it more now. And I think it helps us tell the story of, this is the way Hampton works. We do engagement on everything. It's, it's messy and it takes longer, but we do it. And um, so that's what, what our message is this time. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, appreciate you kind of touching on um, making sure that you're really honest in your application and in your presentation. Uh, the jury, the reviewers, um, they know that a community isn't perfect and they're going to, to see right through any fluff. Um, so you're actually going to be in a better um, situation if you say, hey, this was our problem. This is our, our big scary thing that we deal with an X community. And this is how we're working together to overcome it. So thank you for touching on that component. All right, and last but not least, we're going to hear from the town of Mount Pleasant. Had the um, pleasure of visiting Christian and um, her team earlier in the summer and um, just wonderful banners and celebrations of their All-America City Award uh, status um, all over town. So that was great to hear, uh, great to see and excited for them to share their perspective. Um, let me get going. 
All right, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for um, uh, inviting me to participate in this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of, where's my um, notes screen? I apologize, technical um, challenge here. Never mind. I got it. I'll wing it. Okay, we're good. All right, keep going. Um, so anyway, thank you again for for having me here today. Um, as uh, Rebecca said, um, we are of Town Mount Pleasant. My name is Christiane Farrell. I have had the privilege of um, participating in All America City three times. Uh, Town of Mount Pleasant has been entered three times. For those of y'all who are not familiar with us. We are located across the river from Charleston. That's what most people are familiar with on the coast of South Carolina. We um, have just under 100,000 people in the town of Mount Pleasant. Um, my, I'm not sure I'm advancing my slides. I, I'm sorry, I've got multiple screens and it's... Um, We're seeing if you can just scroll through um, so that we okay. can see that. All right, there right. we go. Okay, there we go. all right. Well, I'm gonna jump right in and apologize for my technical, I usually use Teams. Um, but I'm going to jump right in. So deciding to apply, we hadn't um, been to All America City um, for since 2018. So it had been five years and we saw what the theme was, which was youth engagement. And so we um, sat down as a group and said, OK, what are the things that we need to talk about before we decide to do this again? Do we have some projects that are really going to fit the theme and how unique are they going to be? Um, do we have the resources? Robin just finished talking a lot about this. Do, you, do, we, do you have the resources? Do you have the staff capacity? Because it is a lot of work to, to get together the application and especially as your name, if your name is a finalist. And then finally, if we are selected as a finalist, are the people that we need to be there going to be able to be there? And so the answer to all three of those questions was yes. So then we got to work um, on our actual application and started, we did use the areas of focus that were provided by All America City to help guide us with the selection of our stories. And so looking over on the left side of the screen, those were kind of the, the areas of focus that were su suggested by All America City. And we knew right away we could meet those top four, civic capacity of young people, um, leadership opportunities for young people, because we have a youth council. Ultimately, we decided not to make Youth Council part of our project or part of our stories because a lot of people have a Youth Council, but they, it was well worth including within our application. It just would not be one of our primary stories. So we went kind of went down the line and we're like, okay, well, improved pol police youth relations. Um, a lot of people probably have youth programs too with their police department. How could we take this and, and come at it from a different angle um, that might be unique to some of the other communities. And so we really focused on how our, our programs kind of build trust um, from the beginning and, and work our way all the way up in through teenagers with the ultimate focus on um, many of uh, you all know, um, there, there's been a lot of challenges for police departments over the past um, decade or so. And so what can we do or what are our programs doing to help generate interest in developing um, careers in law enforcement? The next story that we have um, that we chose to, to, to move in on was the improved mental health. We knew we had a, a, a strong story here. Um, we knew that we had uh, a hard story to tell, but it was a story that needed to be shared on a national stage, and that is the opioid crisis. Um, so we have a local not-for-profit that was started by a mom that lives here in Mount Pleasant who lost her son when he was age 19 to substance abuse um, and uh, has um, really grown within our community, um, a lot of collaboration with our police department. And so we decided that that was gonna be part of our story. We were gonna take on something that was a, like I said, a difficult story to share um, and a hard story to talk about, but something that we felt was important to start share with other communities and how we are responding um, with in cooperation with this local not-for-profit. And then finally, we have another local not-for-profit called Just Be. Um, their focus is on the job opportunity, I mean, excuse me, on um, creating sensory-friendly places. Um, and so how do we work with businesses to, to um, create environments that feel safe for, for young people with autism? They paired up with the Mount Pleasant Chamber. And so we were able to expand that even further into 
other neurodivergent people and create job opportunities for um, people that maybe have Down syndrome. So with that, we were kind of able to hit two areas at once. What, what do we have in terms of employment opportunities? And then also it's a really different kind of focus on, on DEI um, where we focused on people with special abilities that sometimes is a group that's overlooked. So that was how we kind of went through our selection process of our, our stories that we wanted to share. Um, Robin talked a good bit about this, getting to work on the application. It is a team effort. There is a lot of research to be done. You know, I, I've worked with the town of Mount Pleasant for a really long time. I know these stories. I thought I knew them really well until I started digging in. And then I honestly, I learned so much more. I was like, wow, we have a great community. And then I realized I was like, we have a really awesome community. We have some incredible people that have done some incredible things. And so, um, you know, I personally got to learn a lot more, did work a lot with, especially with the two not-for-profits that we featured um, within our application, a lot of communication back and forth with them. And I learned a lot there too. And so I think it's really important that those people are engaged um, in, you know, I, share, I interviewed them, I, I shared written drafts with them. Um, because there are certain things that are important to them and their passion needs to come across in the application or later in the presentation. Um, and, and you learn the things that they are sensitive about. It is not you, drug addiction. It is not substance abusers. It is touched by substance use. These are terms that are important to these people and, and need to be included in the application. And then finally, with the application, um, be creative and connect back to your community and things that are important in your culture. Um, we did this within our application, kind of focusing on sweetgrass baskets, which are a traditional African-American art and craft that is unique kind of to the, the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, um, the Gullah Geechee um, uh, culture. And so we were able to kind of get a theme going within that we are weaving in our community just like they are weaving baskets. And I, so I've got one of the quotes here. It takes patience. It takes creativity um, to become a resilient community. We collaborate, we innovate, and together we're going to come and become a community that's stronger and, and more colorful. So try to find a way, I feel like, to incorporate your culture in there and be creative in sharing it. Um, if you are selected as a finalist or even before, and, and this has been said by both Ken and Robin, take advantage of everything that All America City puts out there for you. The webinars that they have, participate in those, you know, as you move forward with the finalists, the press releases, the social media competition doesn't cost you a penny to participate in that. Um, and it's a way to just kind of get yourself elevated and, and get the word out there. Um, we participated in the print ad. It's, you know, just kind of gets you more engaged, a little more visibility. And then finally, you know, if you are selected to go um, to, to Denver, um, the Civic Action Fair, I, I don't have a photograph on, the, on here of this. I've got it on another slide, but uh, Rebecca showed it a minute ago. We went all in. <laughs> we were there to share our culture. We, um, we had about four of us behind, um, handing out goods from, from Mount Pleasant that are unique. To, to Mount Pleasant or to South Carolina, and the rest of our delegation was working the room, um, meeting people um, and having a fantastic time. The cultural showcase, I really encourage you all, if you, if you have the time, if you have the, the, um, you know, the wherewithal and the ability to participate in the cultural showcase. We've done it all three times. This last time was the most meaningful. Um, we did feature our Gullah Geechee core, uh, um, culture. And so we were able to share a lot of old traditions through song, through music, through, through craft, um, through poetry, um, and, and share what Mount Pleasant was all about. Um, and then I forgot to put the Festival of Ideas on here too, but that was another incredible way to engage with another community. And so I strongly encourage all those. The more engaged you are, the more it's going to mean, you know, I said I've done this for three, three times, and this is one of the most unique experiences that you'll ever have the sense of community that comes from not only within with the participants that you have there from your community, but the friends you make um, from the other communities. We we took, we made such good friends that we, our presentation was at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning and we actually had a crowd of people there to watch us in which we did. We thought we were going to be so low. We didn't think anybody was going to be there, but we've made a lot of friends. Um, practice times, that's something else that I take advantage of that. And then raising the money that's been mentioned 
we just reached out um, to a lot of our, our chamber was part of it. Our local hospitals were part of it. A lot of our local businesses, because it can get expensive, especially if you do decide to add something like the cultural showcase that might meet some extra people coming on your trip. But, um, you know, it, it, there are ways, a lot of people that want to probably help support your activities. Um, and then I'll kind of, oh, I know we're probably running short on time, so I'll go real quickly. Um, I've already kind of said a lot of this. When you're in Denver, be visible, be social. Um, go see the presentations that other cities have. Cheer them on. Um, it, you learn a lot, too, from that. And yeah, the mash and t-shirts matter. You can We've got our weaving on there. Together we weave, weaving light, that sort of stuff. It's a conversation starter. Get you engaged with the other cities again when they see your t-shirts and they know who you are and they recognize you. Um, this is, um, there's a lot on this. I won't really go into detail. This is the feedback that we received from the, from the jury after we won and everything, a lot of things that I've just mentioned match up exactly with some of our feedback, the emotional storytelling that was important. The, um, community led efforts. We had the two not-for-profits. Those were things that they picked up on the diversity, which we showed through, um, all the, 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 the community that we have, the outreach with the autism and, and Down syndrome. And then um, the theme of weaving, um, you know, showing kind of that, that creativity in your culture. And then finally, we see some things here that we could have done better at the bottom um, in terms of um, more diverse people answering some of the questions at the end, things like that, that you learn and you pick up on um, and then uh, uh, through the process. The benefits are huge. Our chamber has loved it. Um, our local businesses love it. But especially for our two local not-for-profits that were participated in this, the national exposure for them is tremendous. Um, we made a lot of uh, friends, a lot of connections with a lot of other cities, um, some things that we were already participating on that I've got highlighted here. And then I just uh, included a couple other slides. Um, it, like I said, Wake Up Carolina is so important to us and what we're doing with the opioid battle. So a few things that we're continuing to do there. Um, same thing with the neurodiverse community. And then this very sweet letter. I know Rebecca got one too from Trista who has Down syndrome. And um, she, you read in this letter, I love our town so, so much. These are the things that matter y'all that come out of all of this. Um, and then closing remarks from me. Um, this has already been said by everybody. This is your community story. It is not about the local government. You're a partner, you're a facilitator, but otherwise this is about your community. Um, echoing again, genuine stories. You don't need to be perfect. Talk about your failures and your missteps just as equally as your su successes. And don't be afraid of the hard stories. And then finally, be creative and share your culture. And that is what I have, Rebecca. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much um, for sharing that. Bring brought me back um, to to the wonderful event um, and touched on some of the the items that you'll be thinking about after the application as well. Um, and also uh, apologies, you had to rush through that as our last speaker, but you did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, so that was a lot for everyone to hear. I, I hope that um, you've received some interesting tips. You've learned something today. Hopefully you're a little inspired to, to uh, apply. I, I will just echo that this is the most unique um, event program. Um, that I've ever been involved with professionally, and I've never had someone participate in which they hadn't. Um, so please, please make the leap uh, and consider applying. And and with that, um, let me know if you have any questions. I know we're over over time, so if anyone needs to jump off, that is fine. I totally understand. I put my email address in the chat, so you can um, email me questions if. Uh, if you need to to, to hop off, but um, I'm around. So please feel free to either use the raise hand feature or just um, unmute yourself and jump in or put a put a question in the chat. And then speakers, I also know if anyone needs to go, please, please feel free to jump off. All right, don't be shy. I know there are questions. All right, I'm going to ask a question that we get a lot. Um, are regions allowed to apply? Uh, yes, you can be a town, a city, a county, a region. You can be a tribe that applies. 
um, anyone is eligible. Um, you also do not have to be a municipal government to be the lead applicant. They should be involved. Um, you can be a library or a school district. We've had United Ways apply on behalf of their communities. Um, you could be a faith-based group um, and decide to take over the lead of the application. So it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of top down from the municipality, uh, but do encourage you to, to involve those folks. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions um, going once, going twice. All right. Well, I will let you go and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, but the recording will be emailed to you as well as the slides. I think the speakers shared all of their email addresses. Um, and of course, you will have mine if any questions um, come to mind. Uh, I do hope that uh, to work with all of you on an application for the 2024 awards. Um, and with that, I'll uh, let you have the rest of your afternoon. And thank you so much for being with us here today.